Hey everybody, welcome back to Tim Travels. It's Terry, your host. Um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about some numbers today. Um, and the first thing is a little history. Um, so the, uh, the S&P 500 closed around like 3,600 and change today. It's been as high as, uh, as, as 4,800 and change. And, you know, we're probably, we're, we're in bull market territory. I mean, whether or not we're in recession, I mean, eh, I think we might be, but it, it's always, you don't usually find out until after the fact. But here's what I want to say. And this is, this is, I would call financial psychology or the psychology of investing. Back in 2008, well, actually 2009, March 9th, 2009 is when the market bottomed. And I saw a lot of people that had gone to cash after the market started crashing. And really the market started to crap the bed in April of 2008. And that's when, um, that's when Bear Stearns folded up its tent. And a lot of people didn't know who Bear Stearns was because Bear Stearns really wasn't a retail investment place. And they weren't a money center bank. So, you know, they weren't, you know, they weren't really in the retail space um, as far as consumers uh, knew. But the one thing that Bear Stearns, I mean, they did a lot of things. They were a huge financial firm. But one thing they did is they cleared trades. And that's an important service. That's how stocks get bought and sold, is a lot of times it's, it's trades that are cleared. Now, sometimes if you, you know, if you go to like a Charles Schwab, they might have inventory of a stock that you want to buy. Um, but if not, they have to go out in the market and get it. And there's got to be somebody to clear that trade. And Bear Stearns was a big outfit, a big outfit. And, you know, I was like, wow, Bear Stearns went under. That's kind of interesting and not in a good way. So fast forward a few months and then by August, September, every, you know, the crap was hitting the fan. And by the way, I've met some people over the years that were at Lehman Brothers. And Lehman Brothers used to have a huge facility uh, offices, um, big like ticker board thingamajigs in to near Times Square, just north of it um, on uh, 7th Avenue, I think, maybe on Broadway. But, but anyway, you know, I met people and they were like, well, you know, they were angry that the government didn't bail out Lehman Brothers. Whereas the government poured cash into money center banks like Citibank and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and you know Bank of America to keep uh, the bank system from failing. But the reason they probably didn't buy out Lehman Brothers or I mean give them a lifeline so they could survive was that Lehman Brothers wasn't a bank, a money center bank. That is, they were an investment bank, but. Um, they made bad investments just like J.P. Morgan Chase did, except J.P. Morgan Chase has depositors, has people whose, <coughs> excuse me, whose bank accounts are covered by the FDIC. So it was to prevent a run on banks and to prevent, um, you know, chaos in, in America like you're seeing over in Lebanon right now where people want their money so they go hold up their own bank um, in fact the banks in Lebanon have closed because so many people have just decided they needed to rob the bank to get their money um, there's a woman she got pretty famous and uh, she robbed the bank because her, her sister needs money for cancer treatment and she was like I don't care give me my money but she had a gun so and you know I don't think, you know, <laughs> we'll see what happens, but that's why the government bails out banks. So why am I telling you all this? Well, we've all heard the saying, you know, um, 
buy low and sell high. But I could tell you from personal experience as a financial advisor and, you know, advisor to people on different legal issues that saying that and doing it are two different things. A lot of people lose their nerve when the market starts heading south. And the first thing they do is they panic sell. So I'm here to tell you that if you're um, even mildly inclined to invest some money, it's starting to be a really good time to do that. Um, there's some stocks that I was buying, you know, a year ago or whatever at that are down 20%. But here's the thing, I'm gonna keep buying them. Why? Because I think the fundamentals of the companies are good. They pay dividends. I've talked about, you know, dividend stocks. But you know, like I told people in 2008, I'm like, hey, McDonald's is down, you know, 7% today. I said, do you really think that people are gonna quit going to McDonald's? And the answer is no. I don't care if there's a recession. People are still gonna go to McDonald's. They might not go to Fleming's for a steak or Morton's. They might not even go to like Longhorn for a steak. But they're gonna go to McDonald's. Why? Because they have through every recession since, I mean, McDonald's has been around since basically I was born. And I remember going to McDonald's as a little kid, like kindergarten, okay? There's been a few recessions since I was, you know, kindergarten age. McDonald's still gets bigger and bigger. Same with stocks like Coca-Cola. Same, you know, same with, you know, you look at railroads. I mean, like the big railroads, Union Pacific, Union Pacific has been around for, I don't know, 100 and, they're probably at 160 years, somewhere around there. So, you know, these companies aren't going anywhere. If you really think McDonald's is gonna quit selling hamburgers, no. They're, you know, or Coke. It's the world's largest brand. They're, it's just gonna get bigger. And I, you know, and to put this in more microeconomic terms, I knew a guy one time and, and he had a, like a little independent distribution or distributorship for potato chips, snack foods. And he was in like central um, Massachusetts and also into like part of Rhode Island and stuff. And he was like, business is good all the time. When people are depressed, they eat snack foods. You know, when they're happy, they eat snack fruits. People go to bars. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. He goes, my business, people that eat potato chips aren't gonna quit eating potato chips because they lose their job. They might not eat as many, but they're still gonna eat them. So that's my advice on, if, if you wanna make some money in the long term, um, invest when everybody else is scared. The S&P 500, so I, I referenced March of 2009, the S&P 500 adjusted for inflation, so adjusted for inflation since then has returned over 11% annually. And just to give you an idea what 11% will do for you, there's what is called the rule of sevens. And it, it, it's basically how long does it take to double your money? So the, what you do is just use the number 70, right? And if you divide the return into 70, whatever number that is, is how many years it would take you to, to double your money. So in other words, if the return is 10% and it's compounded annually, if you divide that into 70, it takes 10 years to double your money at 10%. So at 11%, we're probably talking, you know, six years and change to double your money. And here's the other thing, I told you, the S&P 500 closed around 36 and change. It's been at 48. I used to tell people, they'd be like, well, what do you think the markets are gonna do? And, you know, I can't remember what the market was at back then, but let, I think the S&P was around 1260 maybe. And, you know, what I used to tell people is, wherever the markets, I, I don't know how high the market's gonna go, okay? But here's what I do know. If you, if you tell me like the, um, the Dow, if, I think back then the Dow had been to like, 
maybe 26,000, and I might have the numbers wrong. But whatever it was, I was like, look, it's been to 26,000, it's gonna go back. The market will always go back to where it's been. It might not, you know, we don't know if there's gonna be uncharted territory, but it's gonna go back. Okay, so enough about that. A little history, a little finance, but somebody asked me about, um, by the way, I'm here at Love's in Tennessee. I'm sitting up against the pole. <laughs> it's a really nice day. It's a really nice day in Eastern Tennessee. Um, so somebody asked me about, cause I had mentioned, you know, people trying to debate me on US Express and stuff like that. And somebody said, well, what do you think the, the outlook for, um, you know, Prime is, and what do you think Prime's like financial health is? And here's the thing, right? Like Prime, as you may know, is a privately held company. I don't know, other than Mr. Lowe, I don't know exactly who holds the equity in, in Prime, but I guess it doesn't really matter. But here's what I would say about Prime in terms of, um, you know, their financial stability. It, and let me preface this by saying that bigger doesn't necessarily mean better. I think there's probably a lot of companies out there with, you know, 500 trucks that are doing just fine, right? They have their, they have their niche. They maybe have some good customers, um, and then they supplement that with a lot of other stuff. But here's here's what I would say about about Prime. One thing that I like about Prime is if I go back even through some tough times and look at revenue numbers, Prime's reported revenue for 2021 was in excess of $2.2 billion. $2.2 billion. Um, I've mentioned this before, they're the largest refrigerated carrier in North America. Um, that's a good market to be in even when things aren't great. Why? Because again, you know, people are gonna cut back on certain things. Um, maybe they don't buy a new car. Maybe they don't go on vacation. Maybe they don't eat at Longhorn. But maybe they still want to buy a steak. Maybe they still want to buy, you know, Totino's pizza rolls. Because um, they like Kristen Stewart. Um, maybe you know, they're still going to buy beer. Maybe they just eat at home more. And, you know, here's the funny thing. When people eat at home more, I actually think it helps Prime's business. Because while we do move stuff to um, companies that distribute to restaurants like, you know, PFG and um, who else? You know, the, you know the players that distribute like Cisco or whatever. But here's the thing. A lot of, like I have a load right now. It's going to Walmart. I mean, um, it's stuff for, that people are going to use at home. It's not going to a restaurant. Walmart's not a restaurant supply company, okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, there's only, there are certain things that regardless of how the economy is doing, people are going to need and people are going to buy. Um, I, I, think that, I think that Prime is still going to do well. Um, I think Intermodal is going to do well um, as long as the railroads do okay. Um, I think that, um, you know, flatbed may be, no pun intended, flat, um, cause they don't do a lot of perishable stuff. In fact, they do none, um, you know, but, but like uh, tanker, you know, a lot of the tanker is for food service. So again, it's, you know, it's a different side of food service than the refrigerated, but, but I think that, I think that prime is well positioned. Um, the other thing I would say about Prime is that I, a lot of what I look at is indicia of management being comfortable with where they are in the market and where they are in terms of cash and um, finances. Prime just built a brand new terminal in Manuka, Illinois. I don't know if it's open yet. It's designed to be a tanker washout facility. They didn't make that commitment up there, you know, and, and they're, they're forward looking, right? They didn't make that commitment without knowing that that thing was gonna get a lot of use, right? 
You know, like when I ran my own business, I would always be like, you know, I don't want to hire anybody unless, you know, all of my people are already at like 110% of capacity. So, you know, you don't hire because, you know, in some industries, you know, you don't necessarily hire until you're over, you're overburdened, until the demand is more than you can handle, not in anticipation of demand. You know, not to, not to bash on U.S. Express, but they've had a lot of layoffs lately. They closed their office in Atlanta. All of that was just, you know, the office in Atlanta was just for variant. And, you know, they've already started pulling back on that. Um, and part of it is just core, their core competencies and, you know, what they're good at. Um, but I, but I, I, feel, I feel good about Prime and, you know, where it's going to be um, and how it's going to get there. Prime is the 20th largest carrier in the United States. 20th largest that includes everybody that does everything so that includes LTL specialty carriers it includes other logistic companies that really are just brokers um, so prime is prime is pretty big um, you know in in the industry itself but like I said they're they're the team to be in refrigerated so you know when people ask me how is prime positioned um, what's their financial health look like my opinion is they look good you know and I, I say that partially from knowledge that I have like what do I see what kind of loads do I see um, you know so again getting to the micro level but the other thing I would say is that they're they're continuing to add trucks they're continuing to add drivers they're continue you know they're um, I saw a, th a message come over about some upgrades that they're doing some they're uh, remodeling at at the millennial building in springfield which is the main big building that everybody comes and goes i i think it's like the uh it's like the times square of prime you know everybody passes through there at one time it's the crossroads of prime and you know i, I just think that i think prime's biggest problem might be just managing growth and that's a problem a lot of companies have. So it's not it's not just Prime, but you know I think I think there's they struggle a little bit with staffing, um, not necessarily with getting drivers, um, but with staffing at the terminals and stuff like that. But all in all, I think it's a healthy company, and I don't I haven't I haven't seen anything, and I'm I'm always on the lookout for you know red flags for warning signs. And I haven't really seen anything that makes me not feel good about Prime. Um, I think they're investing in themselves. They're investing in the company. You know, some companies, I was, I was at a company that was, you know, quote, employee owned. But the company didn't invest in anything. I mean, I guess they would buy new trucks periodically, new trailers. But the terminals were all crap holes. Um, it was hard to get a truck fixed, you know, just little stuff like that. It's like, why wouldn't you invest in your infrastructure? Um, I guess they just thought, you know, trucks going down the road was enough. But, um, but again, you know, if you're thinking about coming to a large company, large truckload carrier or regular route truckload carrier, I think you could make a lot of worse choices than Prime. I'm not saying it's for everybody, um, but it... it but I think you wouldn't, you don't have to worry about Prime just like folding up its tent, you know. And here's the other thing about leasing. Supposing for a moment that Prime did fold up their tent. I'm not saying this would be a great thing because then there'd be a flood of trucks with nothing to do. But if you were a leaseholder, you could, that lease would still be in force. It wouldn't matter if Prime went out of business, right? Uh, the lease would still be in force and, you know, a bankruptcy trustee would be like yeah keep driving the thing keep paying you know I'm down with that so you could you could move to another carrier if you had to um, I seriously doubt whether that would happen I wouldn't like that but um, I, I, I just think that um, there's always options so anyway uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, love to hear comments of course and uh, we'll talk to you next time on Tim travels bye